Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lori Nandria. I'm living in, in Western Maine currently. I'm going to just briefly uh, say something about my own background as a writer and then talk about my current favorite kind of writing, uh, which is life writing and why I think it's so important for us and um, sort of a basic outline of, of how to do it. So you don't get to choose your aptitudes. If we had gotten to choose, I would have picked art. I love doing art. It just brings me joy. But I didn't get to pick. Um, I, my aptitude from a very early age was for writing. And not writing stories. I was good at nonfiction writing. When I was even seven and eight, I was writing these long funeral orations for the death of my pet frogs. And I wrote, you know, history and arguments and things like that. And because the one place where that aptitude is really valued is in academia, I kept sort of getting drawn back into school. And so I majored in English and then I got a master's degree and then I got a PhD in English and then I went and taught English at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for about 12 years. And there half of my teaching load was freshman composition. So um, call, you know, very new college students. 70% of our students were first generation college students. And my job was to teach them to do academic writing. But because most of the students came in with a great deal of anxiety or lack of confidence in their writing skills, I used to start with something that I thought was easier, which was a personal essay, because everyone's an expert on their own life. And, you know, you don't have to do research to write about your own experience. And so I saw it as sort of a getting your feet wet um, in, in um, a writing class. But over time, uh, I slowly lost my faith in academic writing, which I used to think was really a revolutionary action. And then it became seem less so. And more and more interested in um, the personal essay um, to where it took up more and more of my semesters. Um, and, you know, it, I still have uh, this uh, huge appreciation uh, for the value of uh, what some people now call life writing. It can also be called autobiographical writing or memoir, personal essays and basically means writing based on real life experience. So it's not fiction and it's not poetry, but it belongs in the category of literature. And I believe it is a creative form of writing. We can call it creative nonfiction. And in terms of the publishing realm, we find uh, personal essays in anthologies, collections, and literary magazines such as The Sun Magazine, that's a one that, that features just fantastic examples of personal essays um, that, that I highly recommend. And I, I uh, feel that we should find them in more places um, because it is a bridge building genre. It has a lot of potential, I think, for raising class consciousness and fostering solidarity. This is a quote that I um, chose in honor of, of Women's a Month uh, from a wonderful personal, personal essay by Andy uh, Hotchman. Uh, she writes, um, the picture of charmed and cheerful families uh, took hold in, um, at, I, I actually can't see my whole screen, so I'm gonna skip part of the quote. I hope that you can see it. Um, it was a bit of, post-war propaganda, the feminist movement challenged that post-war myth. In consciousness raising groups, women discovered the exhilaration of telling each other unvarnished stories of their bodies, relationships, families. Women striving to uh, make plain the good and bad of their lives also contributed to a larger change, the breakdown of fictions that divide us from each other white from black, lesbian from straight, old from young. When a woman tells the truth, Adrienne Rich wrote, she is creating the possibility for more truth around her. 
And this, I believe, in a nutshell, is what uh, life writing can do. Um, as writers and as readers, uh, we can learn more about the truth of our experiences and use those truths to challenge the myths that are propagated constantly in the mass media um, by the ruling class, uh, ruling class myths. Life writing has three basic components. It has narration. Uh, there's some kind of story involved. It has, you know, um, a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, something happens, time passes. Often uh, personal essays feature dialogue, and that lets us hear uh, people's voices directly. In addition, it has description. Uh, you want enough description to really make your reader be able to imagine um, that moment almost as if it were happening to them, right? Be able to put themselves in your shoes, um, perceive what you were perceiving. And so techniques for description, including specific word choices, concrete details, figurative language, right? To build um, thick, compelling descriptions. And finally, what I call reflection, which is the writer reflecting on the meaning of the experience and helping the reader understand the meaning of that experience. And sometimes that's made explicit in, in life writing, and sometimes it's left implicit. Um, there are hints for the reader to put together. Um, of course, uh, we want to watch out for preachiness, in all kinds of creative writing, we try to show versus tell. Um, it's common advice given uh, by, by writing teachers. Um, let the, write, the reader see something versus just uh, telling them about it. So let me show you an example. This is a wonderful personal essay called Looking for Work by Gary Soto. I highly recommend uh, his, his uh, personal essays. One July, while killing ants on the kitchen sink with a rolled newspaper, I had a um, vision of uh, uh, wealth that would save us from ourselves. Um, for weeks, I had drunk Kool-Aid and watched morning reruns of Father Knows Best, whose family was so uncomplicated, um, I wanted to imitate it. The first step was to get my brother and sister to wear shoes at dinner. And, you know, he goes on to sort of describe um, the mealtime and in his own dinner table, um, which is, you know, it conveys the, the heat um, and the conversation. Frankie, our neighbor, was beat up by Faustino. The swimming pool at the playground would be closed for a day because the pump was broken and sort of conveys this contrast between his experience and the family that he is seeing on television. So that morning, he says, while doing in the train of ants, which arrived each day, I decided to become wealthy and right away. After downing a bowl of cereal, I took a rake from the garage and started up the block to look for work. And you can see that that's the beginning of a story. Uh, it will be the story that takes place over the course of the day. Um, by the end of the day, um, the narrator will have realized that his own family um, the love and the values on generosity and sharing um, are more important and um, have a more valuable um, than the, the, the family on, on Father Knows Best. But um, another example, this is actually from a student essay, a student in my class that didn't know he could write at all, turned out to be just an incredible writer. Um, he wrote about going uh, hunting for ducks. Um, Actually, my students in Wisconsin really gave me insight into why hunting is so central to family life in some rural areas. I, I learned a lot from, from reading the student's personal essay. Um, this is a paragraph from the middle of that essay. Everyone takes pride in their boat except for one, or maybe it's just a different kind of pride for him. And we can see that as a moment of reflection uh, where, you know, the writer is suggesting, you know, there are different sources of pride. Some people take pride in their boat because it was expensive and it's top of the line, et cetera. Maybe there's a different kind of pride available to, to this guy. He brought his craft upright on the back of a converted bread truck, now hunting van. The owner patched his boat, originally found, I can't see the word, sorry, 
uh, with license plates, sheet metal, and caulk. Um, and um, everyone, you know, sort of laughs at it. He just shouts, it floats right. Um, and here we see, you know, this sort of um, uh, the writer sharing perceptions and leading us maybe to reflect on, you know, what, what um, uh, different kinds of, of pride um, uh, in, in a boat and the, the class dynamics involved in that. Here is a couple of passages drawn from a wonderful, amazing personal essay by Ralph Ellison, who you may recognize um, uh, the, the, the name of that writer. Um, this is an unusual uh, use of the second person. He uses you instead of I, and I think it's a very deliberate attempt to get the reader to position themselves in the um, right, put themselves in the shoes of the character. It got to you first at the age of six and through your own curiosity. Um, you were eagerly anticipating your first day of public school. This is the very beginning of this essay. And he then goes into detail um, what you're imagining and you're watching a brand new school being built right across the street, a handsome structure of brick and stone, playgrounds arrayed with seesaws, swings, baseball diamonds. You're imagining this as a scene of your new experience, but then it turns out that's not where you're going to school. For while located within a fairly mixed neighborhood, this new public school was exclusively for whites. It was then that you learned you would attend a school located far to the south of your neighborhood and that reaching it involved a journey which took you over either directly or by way of a viaduct which arched head spinning high above, a broad expanse of railroad tracks along which a constant traffic of freight cars, switch engines and passenger trains made it dangerous for a child to cross. So the, I just find this so, just punches me in the stomach every time I read it of that contrast between, you know, where he, he thought he was going to start school and then where he actually does start school. And this essay, there's a wonderful um, arc of three different experiences, starting school and then going with his mother to a zoo and getting kicked out uh, because the zoo is is supposed to be only for for white people but then his mother teaches him how to laugh at chauvinism and he's able to use that tool later uh, when he's playing as as a musician in a band and there are the three moments of experience um that sort of a chart this um arc of being just crushed and infuriated by discrimination and how painful that is, but also acquiring a tool to transcend it in some ways. And finally, I wanted to give you an example of a closing paragraph of a um, personal essay. Uh, this was a, it's another really just amazing essay written by a soldier in, in Iraq uh, the, when the Iraq war was going on. Um, I stay up that night thinking of the caretaker's father and the man with the dead cow. I think the old man on the cart, the children who burst into tears when we point our weapons into their cars just in case. I think of my fellow soldiers, the reality of feeling threatened and it all makes sense. Uh, the need to um, point our weapons at them, detain them. But how would I feel in their shoes? Would I be able to offer my heart and mind? So clearly not. So, um, like writing, it often opens in what, what um, you know, writing teachers sometimes call in media res, in the middle of things, right in the middle of life, killing ants, looking out the window at the school, um, right, some action going on, starts opening in the middle of some kind of action, and then ends with some form of reflection, which may be explicit, you know, here's what I learned, here's what I want you to take away, or it might take the form of questions, like Estrada's essay does here, or some kind of vivid image that captures the tensions that have been brought out um, in, the, in the essay. Um, 
one example of that, there's a, an incredible essay by Annie Dillard, a nature writer. She remembers back to grade school when um, someone brought a cocoon into the classroom and the cocoon hatches, but it's too early. It's just hatched because it's warm in the classroom and so its wings can't unfold. And the closing image is the, the um, not quite butterfly, like sort of pulling itself down the driveway with its wings crumpled up. And she doesn't say anything about it. She just gives us that image, but that image conveys the tragic, um, of the, the the human interference in nature, even when it was well meant, it wasn't thought through, and then it, it has resulted in, in, a, in a disaster. Now, as Marxists, as communists, we don't want to offer false resolution to real contradictions, but we do want to offer hope. And you know, this is something that I think is um, possible to do. Um, in, the, in the context of a personal essay. So having given this, this um, quick overview of um, you know, the idea of a personal essay that you would choose an experience that you have had or more than one, usually I think one to three moments of experience work well in a short personal essay. And you would then think about that and reflect, think back, find details, right, that will try really convey that experience vividly to your reader. Um, and, you know, then share this, as uh, Andy Hoffman put it, unvarnished truth of, of your experience. As a process for writing an essay like this, and I realize that some people may have experience as writers, may have their own process, but this is how we um, teach uh, a college in, in freshman English, you know, a good process um, if you don't already have one. You can start with the what we call pre-writing. So don't sit down at your computer and think, I'm gonna write the essay right now. No, um, gather material. Um, generate ideas. You may want to use brainstorming. For example, I'm gonna write for three minutes possible experiences that I might want to write about, or I'm going to try to come up with 20 possible, 20 memories, and then I'm gonna pick from that list. Free writing means just take your notebook and say, I'm gonna write for three minutes everything I remember. And it's sometimes it sort of lets you access things that you hadn't consciously remembered, um, or what's called clustering or webbing, where you would put something like some aspect of that experience or part of a setting, like my kitchen, if you were Gary Soto, you know, the kitchen. Um, and then you would put a circle around that and web out. What are details that I remember about the kitchen? You know, how did it smell? Um, was it hot or cold? You know, what what did the um, uh, what kinds of food uh, were were we making? And you you try to think of details. You may not use all the details, uh, but some of the details to help that come to life uh, for for your reader. So pre-writing, generating material so that you don't fall victim to blank page syndrome when you just like tell yourself, okay, I'm going to write it right now. Uh, and then you have writer's block or you have anxiety when the cursor is blinking on the blank screen. No, instead you've generated material, you have something to work with. The second stage is a planning stage. Um, you can find out whether you are what we call a planner or a pantser. A pantser meaning by the seat of your pants. So planners like to make an outline Personally, I'm a planner. I like to make an outline or at least kind of group my ideas together. What am I going to start with? What's going to come next? But other people just like to start writing. They feel inspired. They have the right energy. They're just going to go for it. And then they're later going to come back and organize. And those writers tend to spend more time in, in the revision stage, which is fine. 
Then comes the drafting stage where you're actually going to draft the essay, telling yourself this is just a draft. It's a first draft. I'm just getting everything out on paper so it can work with it, right? And this prevents us from having these kinds of crippling anxieties of, oh, it's not coming out perfectly the first time. And then take a break, get some distance, put down the pencil, step away from the computer, get some distance from what you've just written before you start fooling around with it. Because right after you've written it, you're too close, um, you, you're unlikely to um, make productive changes. You need to put it aside for a little while. You know, I tell my students at least 24 hours, but longer is better. And then come back to it fresh, and often it will it will look quite differently uh, to you at that point. And that's time for revising, right? I always recommend at the revising stage that you print out your draft. Um, I think it's much easier to revise something when you have it in your hand. You can have a pencil, you know, reread it. You know, if something sounds really bad, just cross it out. You don't need to keep it. Your writing's not fragile, right? it's ready to be worked with. Maybe you'll think of something to add or, oh, these two paragraphs need to be switched around. Um, always keep an eye out in this kind of writing for where you have too much detail and things are bogging down or whether you have not enough detail and, you know, you can't, someone can't really picture it. You may also want to give your draft to a trusted reader who understands what you're trying to do and ask them to give you feedback. Um, and in just a second, I'm gonna show a list of questions because sometimes when you give the draft in, to a trusted reader and say, what do you think? They'll just say, oh, it's great. But you don't want really just compliments, you want feedback. And so giving them some questions can, can help guide them. And then finally do editing. And I always discourage people from worrying a lot about, about grammar and punctuation and things like that until the very end, right? Don't get hung up on those details. But at the very end, you can go through and check for errors and polish your prose style. You may wanna try reading out loud. That may help catch things. Um, and keep in mind too that personal essays, unlike formal academic writing, personal essays have voice, what we call voice. You know, readers wanna hear uh, you. Um, and you may want to break formal grammar rules on purpose um, in order to achieve that quality of voice. Um, here are some suggested questions if you're giving your draft to a responder. You know, you may want to write down questions for them, you know, have them choose the strongest and the weakest paragraph. Uh, what does the essay make you feel? How well does the structure work? Does anything seem out of order? Can you make suggestions for opening and closing? Those are important moments in a personal essay. Suggestions for things to add or cut. And that may spur your reader to sort of give you uh, productive feedback. And then I thought I'd close with this um, quote from uh, the uh, Marxist uh, theorist, uh, George Lukács, um, that I really appreciate. Um, he says, there's a whole group of seemingly left-wing writers who accept the um, destruction of the individual under capitalism as fact. They express their indignation in their art. They expose the horror, but not the human nobility in the resistance to this horror. And that that seems like a mistake, a revolutionary error. Um, we so important to keep optimism alive um, to um, uh, show people why um, you know humanity is worth fighting for and the final victory of humanism is possible um, by showing the um, nobility of people um, in resisting um, the damage and destruction of capitalism. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I again want to say that I believe that this kind of writing is a great avenue for people who want to be working class writers and create a contemporary proletarian literature. Working class life is being left out, systematically excluded, you know, from literature, from television, from film, from media, you know, there are exceptions here and there. 
Um, but there's a, just such an important contribution to be made by people who are willing to share the complex truth of working class life in our society, right? And, you know, um, verify other people's experience, um, which uh, may be, uh, may feel very quirky and, you know, just a fluky uh, to people if they, if they aren't um, seeing that it's widely shared. So I'll stop there and I'll, um, I'll return things to, uh, to, to Dee. Um, maybe there's time for a couple of questions. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Lori. We will take a, couple, a few questions. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, introduce a question, please click the picture of the hand. Okay, Susan, I'm coming to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My question was, when people live in mixed neighborhoods, don't you think that people should only write about the racial experience they know? In other words, do you think they should stay away from the persona of neighbors who are not of their experience? Um, I don't think um, in, in this kind of writing, um, I don't think anyone should write in the first person about experience that is not their own in, in life writing, which is not fiction. I can't speak to fiction. I know that's a complicated debate going on in you know um, the realm of fiction writing. I can't speak to that. But in life writing, you know, I think the whole premise and and value of life writing is this is what happened to me, right? And and so I think you would you know you 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 know may want to write um, about your relationships right, with um, people of other uh, races or ethnicities and, and things like that. But it would always be centered and grounded in your own firsthand experience. Okay, we're looking for other uh, questions. All right, not seeing any other questions, we will now go to our uh, presenters. Um, Thank you, Lori. 